I'm bigger than you. I don't want to talk to you. So I'm going to show you the story. And because I want to share the story, I want to record it. I, I, my wife and I were in Chicago. So Steve was filming the show in Chicago. So my wife said, hey, because this, this is to show you who Steve Harvey is. The misconception is that being a gentleman is just about being polite or courteous to women. In actuality, to be a true gentleman means that you have respect for your fellow man, so it encompasses men and women. Style is something that you evolve into. It's about your personality. It's about how you live your life. 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 To the next episode of the Gentleman of Style Show. I'm Baldwin. And I'm Creech. And today's guest on the show is, I want to call him eclectic almost, because he does a little bit of everything. I mean, he traveled the world doing comedian things. He's an entrepreneur. He's also an ordained minister. He's a whole lot of things. Well, bring him on in. Bring him on in. All right. Today's guest is Mr. James Stevens III. Man, you guys are dapper. Absolutely. Man, I'm looking at your jacket and I'm like, look, well, can you do that to this jacket? I can do that. I can do that, brother. <laughs> tell, tell me what you love and you'll actually see. It has something about, we got something about what, everything about me is on here. About well, the love I'm of Christ. Gonna, I'm going to jump right into that. Go ahead. Well, how, how did you get started in the, uh, like the art? And, you know, the well, I've been, I've been drawing and doodling for a very long time. Okay. So. Uh, of course, you already see my artwork. That's in the, you know, I own the only, the only uh, your mama joke uh, collection, art collection in the world. So, mm -hmm. and but I used to draw when I was a kid. So it, it all really started with my your mama jokes. Uh, was, we were in L.A. doing a lot of comedians. Uh, in fact, Faison's coming tonight. So uh, we used to do a lot of uh, your mama jokes at the comedy store. Mm -hmm. Man, your mama's so fat, she jump in there and get stuck. Yeah, your mama's so skinny, she can hang glide off the table chip. So what happens is like one comedian would get on stage and other people would just heckle him. Right. And he would just keep throwing stuff. Yeah, I saw your mama, your mama got one leg so she walks in a circle, just being very creative. And I'm like, I was sitting in the back, I'm like, yo, this is creative. Y'all said I'm Yeah, so it was creative, so I said, yo. So next time I went, I took a pen and paper and I started writing. So I went home and I started drawing. So I drew 50 pictures of your mama jokes and I put them in a book. And I, I probably sold over, probably like three hundred thousand dollars to date you know for for kids i started my foundation and so when i go to las vegas or travel around the world mm -hmm. i'll talk about my foundation and i'll sell my books or my dvd or cd and stuff like that and all the proceeds go to kids so now i'm probably raised over a million dollars for kids and scholarships that's really nice yeah and north carolina too north carolina south carolina virginia some kids come down from from pennsylvania that type of thing so every year we try to do like 10 scholarships for children, but we've been doing it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. yeah. let's, let's jump back just a tad bit. So, right. first of all, tell us where you're from. I'm re actually was born in South Carolina. Okay. I actually born in South Carolina. Uh, I was adopted when I was a kid, and so I sort of was raised out in Seattle, Washington, doing my thing. And uh, uh, the reason why this is sort of home now, I'm back home uh, with the theater. Uh, my 
my mom, biological mother, lives, you know, 100 miles away, not 100 miles away, but about an hour and a half away. So I go to visit her, and she's 93 years old. Oh, wow. And so God did some really great things of, you know, brought me this way, but I still have a place in Chicago. My wife's a chance of college in Chicago. Uh, and so Generations College, and then um, we have a place in LA. Very nice, very nice. What do you prefer, uh, this coast? <laughs> well, you know, I mean, basically, I slowed down when I was younger. You know, I wanted to be in LA all the time. Right. right? right. So now that I'm older and sort of settled, you know what I'm saying? I like the water. You know, mm -hmm. when I was here, I never got to be able to go to the beach. So now, you know, I got the beach, I live on the golf course, and just chill instead okay. of get out. And I can get to LA when I want to, right. and go up and do New York when I want to. It is what it is. It is so, it is. yeah, yeah. So growing up, I guess. In, in that environment, kind of not being with your biological mother. How did the comedy come in? Did, did, is that how you got yeah. the comedy? I guess probably just tears of a clown, but you right. know. Uh, but I always wanted to really be in show business, always wanted to be like a singer, right? So that was my thing. I like to be a singer. Uh, you know, I can tell you a story. It's, it's, a, it's a really, when I was like nine years old, my dad, his father's from D.C., so my dad would go up to D.C. My, my, I'm the youngest of seven children. So my dad would call on the phone, yeah, you know, back back home. We were in Carolina here, and this is this is a true story. So he calls on the phone. He's got he, he's he runs into James Brown. So he saw James Brown. So he's like, he James Brown was James Brown wasn't as famous as he was, but he was still famous. Mm -hmm. So he gets James Brown on the phone and talk to the kids. We listen to the kids. I was like eight nine years old. Now, I'm so excited because it's James Brown. Right. So like then. Fast forward that about 30 years, 30 years. I'm in DC at the uh, at the uh, in DC at the convention, uh, the uh, Constitution Hall, with James Brown. Mm -hmm. I have never met him before. The only memory I had is when I was a kid. Really. And so I'm thinking to myself, Oh my God, I'm going to meet James Brown. Like I'm in my dressing room, so I don't know whether or not James Brown going to come in my dressing room or not. Mm -hmm. So I'm in my dressing room, and all of a sudden the Dover doors just flies open, and it's James Brown. He's dressed up. He said, I came in. He said, how you doing, man? How you doing? I was like, oh, my God. I said, I said oh, my God. He said, what's your name? And I said, my name's James. He said, your name's James. My name's James. That's a good name. James and James. And he goes, have a good day. And he walked out. Wow. That's a true story. That's a story. Well, that's actually really cool to come full circle like that. It's kind of like, it's almost like something that, a type of thing. Like when I was a kid, right? Like when I was a kid, I don't know if you guys remember the Columbia Records. You guys, because I'm older, you guys, you can like, you know, so they come and come and you can, you can write stuff down and send it off, and then all the records will come, right? Mm -hmm. And your daddy won't get in trouble because your mom and dad don't even know you put it on their credit, right? right. So I, I, I used to see like I used to order the albums: Bill Cosby, Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, Aretha Franklin, and all these people, and I daydream. And the amazing thing is that all those people that on those albums, I got to meet personally. So it's like an awesome thing, you know what I'm saying? Like for me, uh, I'm still a kid. And uh, I, I, you know, like, you know, of course you see up on the wall the pictures of Oprah, and Maya and all those. These are people who are admired as, as a child and not, a, you know, I think it's sort of, sort of like, my, 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 my walk with God makes me feel like, you know, that he says he'll do what he says he's going to do. All things come good for those who love me. But, you know, according to all his, his riches, glory and riches, because God is, his word stands true. Mm -hmm. And so he does these really miraculous things. You'd like to let him know he's there. Yeah. That's, 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 that's good. I'm glad you said that because, um, you know, when we were out here today, we were walking around trying to find, you know, the perfect place to set up. Right. We, have, we know you have some other stuff that's going on right. on the other side over there. And I noticed the journey yes. up there. Can yes. you talk about that a little bit? Uh, that's why that's there, because uh, I want to inspire people and stuff like that. Because, you know, my dad was, was killed in an accident when I was like nine, like, mm -hmm. you, know, right, you know, right after that incident and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Went to James Brown, because he traveled a lot, but when he was in an accident, so there it was really hard because my, that, that sort of started my whole journey. In the journey of where, where am I going? My mom couldn't take care of seven kids, you know. Um, so, I mean, God just took over then. But, you know, I came out of church and, and the Bible, of course, you guys are Southern, so you know how I feel. That that, that, that whole Southern religion thing sort of like molded my, my, my entire spirit of who I am. And uh, 
I knew that one day I was going to be in L.A. I didn't know when or where, but I knew I was going to get to L.A. because I know what I wanted to do. So it took my whole life was this way in my life, and I got to to go to California, and I got in California, and it worked out the way God wanted it to work out. You know, you know, to be starring on a television show, you know, one out of a million people get to do that type of thing. Right. So whether or not you know it lasts for a year or if it lasts for two years or whatever. That's a miracle to be, you're a miracle that you got that. And so at the end of the day, I remember like Def Comedy Jam, Russell, Russell Simmons says, I don't want him on it, I don't want him, he's too clean. He's too clean, I mean, he, you know, he's not a deaf deaf, you know, but my manager was friends with him, he goes, and my manager was like, yeah, he is, he, he's gonna do the show, because they were friends. And so I got on a show and I killed, you know what I'm saying? And. Uh, and that was, you know, that, that was a, and from that, all other things, the doors have started to open, you know what I'm saying? Like he's going to open up that window for heaven for you with blessings. Mm -hmm. And that's what, you know, happened to me. And I never, ever, I never looked back. Even today, I always feel that God is calling the shots. Right. You know, there's a, there's a new book out called God's Wink. Mm -hmm. And uh, the book is called God's Wink. So when God show up, it's like he, your life, he's winking at you. And people don't really truly know that God is communicating with them because they're not connected to their divine purpose. <clears throat> Once you connect to your divine purpose, I don't. I feel like there's nothing that you can't do. <clears throat> I believe that, that's what the words say. Absolutely. Yeah, and so my whole life is predicated on that. What, what, let's, let's talk about your uh, your journey into ministry. Yeah, well the journey, journey like you know, I, I, I was writing a book mm -hmm. when I was in LA called, you know, um, it, it says, uh, what is it? it was about, uh, Hollywood, and you know when when uh, Jonah, you know, the, the Jonah was was you know swallowed up by the whale mm -hmm. for three days and three nights, and the book was like I was swallowed up for twenty five days, twenty five years, and then I got spit out, you know, because what happens in my life? You you go through life so fast, all the stuff that's happening around you, you don't truly know, you know what I mean? I love the Lord, I go to church, I do all this thing, but then God does this. God says. You know, God. You know, they, John, God told Jonah, but he wanted to go to Nineveh, and and uh, he said, "Hey, I don't want to go. I don't like those people. I don't want to go save those people." And God said, "No, you need to do this." Then he ran away. Mm -hmm. So I feel like I was ran away a little bit from God. You know what I'm saying? And then God came. You know, that's when a lot of times tragedies happen in your life, but you don't you don't look at the tragedies as God coming to say, "Okay, now I'm coming to collect." You know what I mean? It's time for you to do what you do. So about that time in LA, I mean, everything I had, every, everything went bad. Everything went, everything that could go bad went bad. You know, the voice, uh, just, uh, I, I fractured my hip working on a television show. So I was, I was, I was walking with a limp. So you can't really get no, no, you can't, you can't act or do nothing like that, looking like that. And all this stuff happened in one, at, at one time. And it was like, it was like, oh. Man, and uh, we know I had a big house and all that crap, and I had the, you know, the the, the, the baby doll wife and all that, <laughs> and I lost it all. And I'm driving in L.A., got my stuff in the back of my truck, you know what I'm saying? And I, I put out Harold Melvin in the Blue Nose. I'm listening to Bad Luck. That's what you got. That's what. You got. Bad Luck. Bad Luck. Bad 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 Bad. bad. You know what I'm saying? And I remember, man. I mean, please. Pulled me over when I was driving and said, "Yo, I said, yo, what's up?" And he's like, "Police, were like, yeah." So give me your license, and I'm like, "Oh man, I didn't have no driver's license, man." Give me my license, and he said, "Oh no," he goes, "I can have a license." And he said, "So man, I just, I just, I just got put out of my house, man. I'm going through the divorce." He says, "It's all good. Get it when you can, bro." He says, "I already been there. Good luck." Wow. Yeah. So that's when God was sort of messing with my spirit, you know, even when. Uh, you know, the judge was like, what do you want? You know, like, and I said, look, just get, let me have my son on Sundays for church. I'd be happy. My baby boy, you know. And uh, God just started messing with me. And my whole life turned around, you know. Um, so uh, I I just, like, started, like, you know, just, you know, going to church with my son every Sunday. We cry together because he was only, like, four or five. He probably didn't know why dad was crying every Sunday. But uh, but God turned it around, came back, you know what I'm saying, like came back, did another television show and stuff like that. And um, uh, you know, 
you know, started doing great things. That was actually before that I didn't, I, I was one, I wanted to be Oprah, like, you know. I started on the show, but I was on Robert Townsend television show, me and, and uh, uh, God, a couple of people, a lot of comedians, uh, Eddie Griffin and all that was all we were doing some of the impression. Then I did uh, Stephen Miller's show, Dana Carvey show, and when I was rolling, Def Jam and all that, I wanted to meet Oprah. I really wanted to meet Oprah, man. I was like, God, oh, what do you mean? Because I feel like I met mean, Oprah's over, you know. So Oprah was like a queen. You know? She's like bigger than life. And so and then um, until I connected with my divine purpose, you see what I'm saying? Like I always talk to kids about it. When you connect, and I connected when I was young, and, you, and then what happens is, that I said, you get on the yellow brick road because you know it's where you're going. But sometimes that those flying monkeys come and they pull you off of there. And so you're on the, you're in the, the poppy fields and stuff like that. And then when you find your way back, and that's when God wink at you again. Mm. And so it's like to be able to, I got a, a letter from a guy and saying, hey, I'm, I'm, his name was Bob Brown. Uh, he's from up there, High, high Point. Went, yeah, went, and he, he was like, I've seen you because I performed for uh, uh, for uh, Stab Stebman. I went to perform for he has a thing called Athletes Against Drugs, right? So I went to perform for him, but Oprah is normally there. She's not there, so I missed it again. So you know what I'm saying? So it's like, but then, but there was a guy there who said to me, "Say, yo," he sent the letter. He goes, "Listen, I saw you there. He saw me in Washington performing for like Black like Caucus and all that. He saw me three times, and he says, listen, I want to help you.' He says, you're your talent and everything you have, the world should know about it. He says, so I'm going to do the best I can for you. So he was, it, but I didn't meet the guy. He just sent me a letter. And he wanted me to meet him. And I was like, I don't know this guy. You know what I mean? And uh, my assistant said, yo, I know this guy. We need to go meet him. So we met him. That's what he said to me. And he says, so what we're going to do right now is we're going to get in my car. I'm going to drive you over and let you meet Maya. Wow. And, yeah. And I said, wow. really? He said, yes got in his car, drove to Maya's house. Maya's was like, hey, you know, so like, like, I'm with Maya Angelou, I'm freaking out, like, <laughs> right? So I'm up here trying to impress her, I'm like doing good, yes, indeed, this is Bill Cosby, and she, she was like, hey, she said, hey, you don't have to impress me, you're already in my house. Thanks for all out. And then she said to me, she said, Mr. Stevens, I already seen your video and your work, she says, you got that it. And that's why I put that out there on the wall. And she said that to me. Never forgot it. And then, you know, saw it two or three more times. I performed her at her 80th birthday party and her 85th birthday party before she left. Matter of fact, that was the 85th up there when she was left. But it was an amazing thing. Like when you're like you in this thing, you don't even think about it. You, 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 you're just walking around with a gym. I didn't videotape it. I saw an interview with uh, Chappelle. Chappelle was at her house mm -hmm. and it was a whole interview. The same thing happened with me, but we didn't record it. I was like, oh wow. my gosh, wow. I wish I'd recorded that. She wow. said, listen, I'm going to cook for you and blah, 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 blah. She's, she's an amazing woman. Mm. And Oprah's the same. If you met Oprah, Oprah is like a sister. You know, when you meet her, she goes, hey, you're like, you know, <laughs> but you're not expecting that. And right. she's so down to earth and she makes you, you know, you know, it's just open up to her. So we, you know, we talked for a long time and I became friends with uh, Stephen and her. So, and, and it's, it's been, only God can do that for a kid that was, you know, born on the floor. Right. And my dad says, if you're born on the floor, there's only one way that's up. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it's amazing how God does what God does. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, like, with my beautiful wife, you know what I mean? Uh, she, she was a dean at Duke when I met her. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. You know, God gave me her. And dude, it was just amazing because she was looking for a Christian comedian, and uh, you know, and they were doing a fundraiser, and so she's looking all over the place. So she found me, and so when I came in there, it's like it was really weird. Like, oh, I talked to her on the phone. I didn't even know she was black. I didn't know she's so. You know, she went to all Ivy League schools, so she's really, really articulate, right? So I'm on the phone with her, and she was like, "Yes, I need for you to come." I was like, "Oh, blah blah blah." Like, who are you? You know what I mean? Like I thought she was like Italian and Jewish, you know. So uh, I said, I'll tell you what, you know, she was like, I said, you can't afford me, but if you meet me for lunch, you meet me for lunch or dinner, then we can talk about it. And that's the way it happened. So we met at Carabas. <laughs> that's our favorite spot now. So at Carabas, 15 years ago, we've been married for 15 years now. We met at Carabas, man, and uh, 
man, we talked all day. When we talked about God, we started talking about God. It was nothing about I love you, I like you, whatever, it was nothing. It was just like, we were just talking about God. Like, we really was, like, you know, it was amazing. And we talked from like eight o'clock to one o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. So when I get in my car, get her in the car, get in the car, I'm driving, we stop at the light. And I'm like feeling weird. I'm like, I look over at her, I'm like, I never felt that about a woman before, but I'm like, I don't want to leave this woman. I didn't want to be without that woman. I just met her. And, uh, and that's the way God that did it. And, and we, now we, we've been together now for 15 years. And we, you know, we, we like to say we are on one accord. Mm -hmm. uh, and so she has a Christian ministry, women's ministry that she does. Uh, matter of fact, she's going to be at the Bible Museum in, in D.C. in October. You know what I mean? She's, she has women coming from all over the country, all over the world to do what she does. Uh, you know, she... She built uh, houses for, for schools and stuff like that in Malawi and Africa. And so, you know, now I'm praising my wife. You, can, you guys can't hey, no, 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 I'm giving you the whole story, you know what I'm saying? Oh, you, you, when, you have a woman of that caliber. Yes, man. Right? You better mention her name. Yeah, well, there's, well there's, there's, not, there's not me without her and I'm not her without yeah. me. And that's what it's up, you know. Mm -hmm. It's like, so we, you know, basically, we, you know, we moved to Chicago. She, she took over to uh, it's called McCormick College, it's a hundred year old college, and she took over that college. It was failing uh, and didn't have credit accreditation. And they said, listen, if you can just get us three year accreditation, you know. She went in there and she got them 10 year accreditation right up, right off the bat. And from that, you know, she's been very praised that we were in Chicago, so like, you know, I'm getting older now, so I'm like, we're trying to figure out what we're gonna do. I didn't like the cold weather because I did it for her. I said, I, I like LA or, you know what I mean? We had been here before, mm -hmm. so we bought a house here. And I said, honey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go to our house during the winters. And then, you know, she was like, okay. So what she did was, brilliant as she is, she, she decided to take someone, a vice president, made him president, and then she became the chancellor, and then she could then work from home. Brilliant. Yeah, so then she, so she, she, free yeah, so she flies to Myrtle, Myrtle Beach to be with me all the time. She flies up once a, once a month and she runs the college. It's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Intelligence is something. Yeah. And as you said, and beauty. Yeah, she got it all, I guess. Can't she, she tell a joke? Can't you tell a joke? She doesn't really understand jokes. You know, that's what I'm saying. She's like Captain Spock. You know, she's very left brain. You know, she's a left brain person. So, you, so she's like, she watching me kill. She goes, where does people left me? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you. Are you serious? Yeah. And so now, basically, she's starting to joke around a little bit more yeah. now. And she'll do something that's really weird. And she goes, I'm joking. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but no, she's a left brain. I'm a right brain person. Mm -hmm. I'm sort of like a split brain. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, left brain is very logical, everything like that. Right. right brain is the guy over the top. You know what I mean? Right. So, I mean, with everybody, we were talking about my journey and like everybody on this wall. It, up there, you got you got Garth Brooks up there, and uh, that was a, we we raised twenty million dollars for the Ronald McDonald House charity. So it was it was Garth Brooks and Michael Jordan, and I was the uh, I was the, the, the headliner, the performer, because mm -hmm. Garth did like four songs, four mm -hmm. songs on a guitar. Okay, and so but you know everybody came to see Garth, but Michael Jordan was there, to get, you know, and so the Ronald McDonald House charity raised twenty million dollars. And I was performing, I was a performer. Uh, I already knew Michael, so that was really cool because Michael and I met in the 80s. And uh, so we became really, really good friends. And Garth, I had never met Garth Brooks, so now we're, Garth Brooks and I talking, and he was like, I love you, man. I, I need, I want to do a movie. I do it because I want, I want I, you look like Whoopi Goldberg. <laughs> he was saying, like, hey, he said, so he said he wanted to do a movie with me. So, so we, we talked. And, so I got on stage, and one of the things, like when I when I performed, I, I talked about Michael. I said, I said Michael Jordan, I said Michael Jordan's over here, but you know, I said I said, listen, man, there's no difference between you and me, man. I'm from North Carolina, and you from North Carolina. The only difference between you and me is I got cut, <laughs> and people sort of laughing. And I said, listen, man, I said, look, you know, don't try. And then it's like, well, Michael showed me backstage. He said, man, I hope you can make these white folk laugh. <laughs> he did say that. So, and I said, yeah. I said, let me tell you something. I said, I said, listen, it's Michael Jordan. He said, I said, look, I said. Didn't you say you weren't going to give me by these autographs? And the people were in there. And, he, and I said, and then I grabbed up this piece of paper that had his autograph on it. I said, it's Michael Jordan. I got his <laughs> autograph. He's over there. And then I looked at him and I said, now try to get out. 
<laughs> it was funny. Wow. And so, yeah, so that was cool. I mean, meeting all these people always been like sort of miraculous, you know. Uh, you know, you see those people rising there, people yeah. rising, you know, just from South Carolina as well. And uh, my foundation, our scholarship foundation, I raised all this money for kids, and uh, I had people come, you know, for the fundraiser and stuff like that. So I get to meet a lot of people that way. Known Dave Chappelle since 14, 15 years old. Yeah. And so I was, I was, yeah. The, oh. Yeah. And since I've been knowing him since he was 14, 15, we were with the same manager, uh, Barry Katz, you know, we got Barry Katz, and we were the same, we were the same manager at the same time. And uh, when he was at, uh, um, in uh, doing his uh, his uh, Netflix special in New York City, he inv we invite. I just happened to be in New York, and I was at the Comedy Cellar down. This where a lot of comedians. If you ever want to meet Chris Rock or Chappelle, that's their that's their like home club. So if you're if you're on a Saturday night in, in New York City, go to uh, the Comedy Cellar in New York. The comedy Cellar. Yeah, yeah, it's the, it, yeah, it's in the Village. You go there, they're 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 there like. God, I guess 75% of the time that I've been in New York, like every time I've gone there, they've been there. And so I was there, and Chappelle was there, and uh, and he said, everybody was trying to get to Chappelle, and he, he wouldn't he wouldn't sign autographs or anything. And then I just walked up, and he was like, man, <laughs> you know, know Daddy J, I went on, I wouldn't even, if I'm gonna sign an autograph, it'll be for that guy right there. OG, that's my OG, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. So I went up and we took a picture together. And he said, "Listen, I'm doing this show tomorrow. Let me let me uh, invite you to the show." And so I went to the show. I got backstage and stuff. Like that. And I had never seen Dave work an hour before. Like I don't watch television, like comedians on TV and stuff like that. But I see him live all the time. So I would see Dave get on stage for 20 minutes at a time. You know. So I watched him for an hour. And he killed, you know what I'm saying? He was at Radio City Music Hall, he killed. So we backstage and I was like, I gave him a hug and I whispered in his ear, I said, you do, you're the man, bro. The man. Yeah, because, and after that he got his, uh, his award in Washington DC when he got the, uh, uh, the Humor Award, the Mark Twain Award, so that was really awesome. Let me, let me ask you this question in terms of the Asher Theater. Okay. Lovely, lovely, lovely spot. Anybody who's coming to Myrtle Beach, make sure you come check out the Asher Theater. We will not be disappointed. How did the idea come for the Asher Theater? Well, you know, in 2004, I signed a deal with Harris, Caesars Entertainment, for a million dollars a year to be in, in New Orleans to perform there. So, you know, I went there, and you know, they had billboards all over the place when I got there, me, and, you know, I mean, I mean, I was, they were treating me like a king. And uh, so it's like really cool. Uh, and, and and if you remember 2004, it's also when Katrina came. Yeah. So four months into my contract, Katrina came and wiped everything out. Wow. So I was like, oh. Was there a hurricane clause in your contract? Nah, no. They, <laughs> they, they call it force majeure, it's over, it don't matter. So right. I tried to come back and I could never get back because I loved that. I had a five piece band and uh, you know, I was doing everything. Sammy Davis Jr., Frank Sinatra, you know, I love that type. I like my comedy, but I love the music and comedy, you know what I'm saying? That old black magic got me, and that was, that was fun. And so, I mean, I mean, we're talking from there until now, I was still trying to find my own venue, like to be in Las Vegas and whatever. And so one, when my wife and I was here on vacation, one of my friends was playing at, uh, at Alabama Theater. You know, he's, he's from LA, but he was in Alabama Theater. We went to see him. My wife, like she's sitting in the audience, she said, man, you're better than that. Like she was talking about the whole show. And she said, you know, and so, yeah, so that's what, yeah. So she was like, I think we, she said, we should, you should do your own theater. I said, really? Say, that's the kind of woman I have. And I was like, she, I said, really? She said, yeah, you should do your own theater. So we're gonna, we're gonna do that. So we can be together. You know, that's what she said. I said, okay. So we came and uh, we prayed on it because we always pray. We pray on everything, we make decisions. We pray on everything, and then we 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 said, "Hey, we found it. okay." I'm gonna back. <laughs> we also went into church, my wife and I. So we, you know, we that's why we study and no, we wanted church. So you know, Asher is biblical. Asher is one of the tribes, the twelve tribes. Asher. 
So we actually wanted our own venue. We're all we listen. We did everything. We we're in Chicago studying. We did. We read so many books together. We read books and stuff because we feel like God called us to do our own place. And then, so what I'm saying is, when I moved down here, we got our own place. She said, "I should have my own venue." She said, and "She said we're going to have church on Sundays. You know, we're going to create our own church." I said, "So young that we build a following." And we can tell you know, people to come and see us. We can give them the word of God on Sunday. That's the way it happened. And believe it or not, God, he winked at us again because he didn't, he, didn't, he didn't set this up for me. He set this up for the church that's here right now. We have a church on Sundays because, listen, we opened up, man. We, we were failing. We had, a, we had a, the hurricane the first, the first year we opened up. Blah, blah, blah. The money was going everywhere. We were losing like thousands of dollars. And I'm like, my wife said, we got to get out of this. No. And I said, no, we got to stay. We God wants us to do this. And that's what we, and we, I'm telling you, man. And God, he came every time we were going to leave. Every time. Uh, we, we didn't have any money. We came not pay our lease. And then all of a sudden, this guy from England says, he had the palace theater here. Mm -hmm. And it, and it, and it, and it got, uh, they had to shut it down during the hurricane, so he says, "Can I bring my axe here?" And he paid me. So for that next year, they actually paid my bills. And then things still got bad again, you know, you know. And then before COVID, and then when I knew God went, this guy walks in and he says, "Look, I'm, I mean, I'm losing money." I call up my friend, that's the same bad. I call same bad up. Me and same bad have been knowing each other since I was 18. I called him up, see y'all, man. I said, I'm losing some money, I don't have any money. He said, bro, I ain't got no money, but I'll come down there and perform for you. He said, man, because I'm taking care of my whole family. You know, he's talking, that's where he talks. So it was like really weird. So I was like, okay, okay. So what we did was, he says, listen, but don't close. He said, God, God man, you see, you're doing something good, right? The next week, a guy walks in here and says, hey, I want to rent from you guys. I said, what? I'm going to rent from you guys. He says, I'm a pastor. And I'm saying, it's okay. So I'm thinking, okay, $500 or whatever, you know, come. And so he says, listen. And then he, he looked over there and he says, you know that guy right there? And I said, yeah, that's my friend. Sinbad's right here there. And I said, I said he said, call him. And asked me to do this. He does he know my name, Sean. So I, I, I text him on the phone and he texts me back. He goes, it's good people. Well, he's under the covering of Sinbad's brother-in-law. Sinbad's brother-in-law is the chaplain for the Washington Redskins. He has he has a huge church in, in Washington called Grace Covenant Church. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> this guy says, listen, charge me what you want to charge me. I want to come here. So he that's them right there back there doing their choir rehearsals. And they have, he has an office here. And uh, God then winked at me again and took me through COVID. They've been here for over a year. And... Uh, and they've been blessed, and we've been blessed. Yeah, it's, it's, that's what I'm saying. So, as a matter of fact, last Sunday, uh, I got to meet him. I never met uh, Sinbad's brother-in-law, but I know Sinbad's wife, which is his sister. Mm -hmm. I told him, you know, and so we met for the first time last Sunday. It was really weird. I said, listen, I don't know you, but I know your sister. I know your, your niece, uh, Paige. She's a singer. Sinbad's daughter is a singer. I said, I held her in her, when she was like nine months old, I held her in my arms. And he was like, he said, so then I told him about the whole thing, how this happened. He said, well, see, that's, that's God. You know, that's his divine, you know, purpose. And that's what was up. And that was like, Sinbad was like, see, I told you, I told you. And now he has, you know, Sinbad has, a, has suffered from a massive stroke. Really? Yes. Oh, you guys know? Yeah, it's been almost a year, bro. Wow. He's suffering from a massive, I know, I know we had seen him now. massive stroke, man. You know, so as a matter of fact, I wanted to do a huge uh, uh, fundraiser here for him so we can raise some money and stuff. But yeah, you know, matter of fact, I, I had a thousand of those wristbands that says pray for Sinbad printed up, but they didn't come out good, so I was gonna get some new ones so that people could come in and give us five dollars, you know, just and try I wanted to raise them like five thousand dollars like that. Whereas I think people would do that. Just take one of these, put the five dollars in a box, man. Where, where where is he? Is he just he doesn't he's live in, here? Right? No, he's in Los Angeles. He's in Los Angeles. He's in Los, he's in Los Angeles, yeah. He's been out there forever, you know. And uh, and right there was like probably I mean, six months to the time that he had the stroke, mm -hmm. because he was in Raleigh Durham right there, mm -hmm. and so I, I went up to see him in Raleigh Durham. We hanging out and stuff like that backstage, and um, yeah, it's not too long after that it happened. You know, so it's uh, it's 
some tough, tough, tough times, but he's a good dude, and he's a he's the son of a, a pastor. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely sending prayers to Sam Bad. Yeah. You know, if you do a fundraiser, definitely let us know. Yeah. That would be awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. So in, in terms of comedy, I mean, you talk about Christian comedy yeah, yeah. And, and clean comedy, how has that, how has your journey been with the other comics that, that don't, you know, subscribe to Christian yeah. comedy? Well, you know, I do, I just do clean comedy, okay? And you call it clean comedy, it's like Christian comedy because it's like that, you know, you know, just have, I just have fun. I do what God, God put me on this earth to do what I do. To tell jokes, I do. I tell jokes. Um, I have fun. A lot of comedians, you know. I've always been clean uh, because I do a different style of music and all that type of thing. They used to say I wasn't a comedian; I was an entertainer or whatever. You know, Jamie Foxx does the same thing. I do. I do. I put. I was the first person to put Jamie Foxx on stage. You know, in L.A. At, at, you know, at the, the big, the big, the big clubs because I was a, I was a fan of his. He was under me. Uh, you know, I worked every night at the comedy store. If you guys watch the Netflix special, if I was in LA, I'd have been on that Netflix special because of the fact that I was I was one of the, the first black guys at the comedy store. Me, George Wallace, people like Sinbad can only perform at that place. Black comedians couldn't perform there. And one thing I say about it, like, but on the Netflix special, they're talking about they're talking about yeah, you know, they're giving them a lot of praise. Now, I give them praise for giving me a break in LA at the comedy store. But like Fat Tuesdays and all that Chocolate Sundays, I'm sure you may have heard about that. You can Google it. But you know, to me, Fat Tuesdays and Chocolate Sundays was sort of like racist because what happened is out in LA they were like saying, "Oh, black comedians can't perform there during the week, but they can perform on Mondays and Tuesdays, the off nights." That's the way Fat Tuesdays and you know Chocolate Sunday started. So, and I'm surprised they didn't they, they didn't say that in the special, but it's like you know. Guy Tory is doing it. Guy was not even in LA when I was there, you know. So get, Guy came later, and now you know he gave the comedy store a lot of praises. People got the names on the walls, you know. My name's on the wall at the comedy store, which is supposed to be, you know, really prestigious to have your name on the wall because people used to kill themselves to to be on that stage at the comedy store. I mean, literally, a guy jumped off the building next door to the comedy store. It's the Hyatt Regency. Some guy, you know. He got rejected. He jumped off the, this 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 building and killed himself right by the comedy store. Yeah. So, but as far as my journey is concerned, I mean, I feel like I'm doing. I'm, I don't hate on people. Not jealous about people. Uh, you know, the only thing I don't like about the business in my is like people that you've helped, or you know, along the way, and then they act like you're not even exist. You don't exist anymore. I can I can tell you a story about Steve Harvey if you want. Steve. Let's hear that. Yeah, let you hear the story because a lot of people love Steve Harvey. You know, yeah. Steve Harvey and I used to uh, uh, we we were um, um, used to date sisters. You know, the crazy sister that he divorced. Okay, but he had been married like before that. And, you know, had twins and left them. You know, all that. So Steve, uh, he used to call me every day. Yo, man, yo, man. I was in LA. He was not. He was in Dallas. And then, you know, so he used to call me every day. And he was just. So he became famous. When he became famous, he came to LA and he started acting weird. And I'm never like, you know, comedians, like, like I've helped a lot of people. And Steve, Steve Harvey, Ricky Smiley. And Ricky Smiley, I tried to say Steve was the first person to bring him on stage, but I was. You know, mm. he's in Birmingham, Alabama. He couldn't get on stage. Ricky Smiley, you know, want to get on stage, so I, I got him on stage. I have a, you know, I'm not here lying or nothing like that with you. I have a VHS that Ricky Smiley sent me, you know, when I came back home because he wanted to get on television, and all the material material that he did was from a guy named Daryl Savat. He sort of stole Daryl Savat material and then sent it to me. I still got the VHS, so if I really wanted to dog him, I could have dogged him. I've never ever, you know, what I mean, I could have gone on larger platforms and said. Here's the VHS, let's look at it. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, because all these guys, they, they got famous and they ain't like, you know, I'm bigger than you, I don't want to talk to you. So I'm gonna show you the story. And because I want to share the story, I want to record it. I, I, my wife and I were in Chicago. So Steve was filming the show in Chicago. So my wife said, hey, because this, this is to show you who Steve Harvey is. So my wife says, you know Steve? I said, yeah, I know Steve. So he says, she said, I'd like to meet him. 
So I said, okay. So we go to, we, we go, I, I call Rashawn McDonald. So there's, there's a comedian that became Steve Harvey's manager. Mm -hmm. He's a friend of mine too. Like we all, it's just, I mean, Steve, I mean, Rashawn and I used to live in the same building in LA. So he set us up. My wife and I, we dressed up real sharp, you know. They had us sitting like on the front. So they, they shot like t two different segments before they got to my segment. So they shot a segment away from me and over here, then they shot one right in the center in front of me. And when Steve saw me, he was like, oh my God, oh, is that James? Like, you know, he knew I was there, but he was performing for the crowd. So he's like, oh, that's my dog, that's my dog. And my wife's sitting there like, I can't believe it. Come down here, so I come down to the set. My wife's crying because she thinks it's like a family reunion type thing. <laughs> so he comes, he hugs me, and he says, oh man, you still doing comedy? I said, yeah, 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 yeah. He said, oh good man, I love, I love this dude. He says, if it wasn't for this dude, there would be no, no, no Steve Harvey. Right? You see, I mean, he was just that adamant. And so I walked back up. He went, grabbed my wife, hugged her. So I sat by my wife, she's crying. And she looked over at me and she said, why did you do that? I said, what? She said, what did you do to him? I'm like, like, why isn't he in our lives, right? So, you know, I saw, you know, like, the, 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 I, I put my hands on my mouth because they got, they got, you know, they got cameras, they can see. So I said, bullshit. <laughs> you know, and she said, what? I said, bullshit. I said, this guy, he's, he's, he's lost, lost his mind because he was talking, you know what I'm saying? Like, there would be no Steve Harvey. So I said, I said, just, just wait and see. So after the show was over, everybody got up and they left, they walked away. Everybody was gone. There's just two of us there at the sitting on the set. Everybody was gone, You're waiting for him to come out and say, hey, my friend, I haven't seen you in 10 years. Instead, he sent a PA out there and said, hey, Steve says, have a nice day. This is the way out. Wow. wow. So I want you to get that story. You're wow. the only person I ever told this story to. Wow. Mm -hmm. But it's a true story. That's so disrespectful. Though. Yeah, it was so bad, you know. That's so <laughs> that's, disrespectful. That's, that's who that guy is, you know. But you know what I'm saying? Um, if we if he walked in the room right now, he'll sort of smile and go, hey, my dog, my dog. But at the end of the day, that's just who he is. And that's who he's always been. Man. So that's, that's, that's just purely just a change in attitude over time. You did yeah. nothing to I've you. never done anything to Steve at all. I mean, we, matter of fact, I mean, his, uh, the girl, the woman, his his wife, Mary, sister, right. um, I used to date, and we were really close. She was killed in the in a vehicle accident, a car accident, right? And she was dead for like three months before I found out she was like Steve didn't tell me or nothing that she was dead. That's crazy. That's crazy. So, and you know. And when I talk to, like even now, like I talk to her daughters, which is, you know, and she said, he goes, he goes, Steve, Steve, Steve Harvey was an asshole. When my mom died, he didn't come to the funeral. He didn't try to, he didn't give us money to try to help us. You know, we need some help. He says, he's an asshole. So, it's sad, you know, it's sad. But it does nothing to me, you know, I'm good. I'm not, I don't hate on him and stuff like that. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just who he is. Like, you know, there's a lot of other stories I can tell you about other people, right. but it is what it is, you know right. what I'm saying? But these are just people that were close to me, you right. know what I'm saying? Right. You know, um, you know, so, you know, like, 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 I give people props, like Chappelle, who says, hey, this is my guy, let's come hang out, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I give props to people like that, people who, you know, when you become famous or whatever, my whole thing is to look to, no different between you and me. My success is just on another level. You see what I'm saying? Right, right. Like what I told you early on about my dad saying if you're born on the, on the floor, it's right. only one way is up. Right, right. And so, you know, I, I may not break, I may have not broken the glass ceiling, bro, but I'm way off the floor. Right. You see what I'm saying? Right. I said, well, I mean, I tell us, so I tell a lot of comedians and people who, like I said, how many cars can you drive? <laughs> yeah. How many houses can you sleep in? Right. How many beds can you sleep in? Right. So, you know, I got all that. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I'm so, and I give, all the glory to God mm -hmm. because man that's that's it that's the only way that's what's more important you know what I'm saying my favorite uh, scripture is Matthew 6 26 mm -hmm. it says uh, look at the birth birds in the air they need a soda or read the God in barns but I heavenly father take care of us aren't we more important than them so what's what's the biggest lesson that you have learned uh, going through some of those things uh, that you you know that you 
just spoke and, about. Well, I think the lessons that I've learned is just stay focused, you know, on who you are. You know, once you connect to your divine purpose, know that it's a journey. Right. Know that it's a journey. Know that, you know, you're going to you're gonna be pulled off the, to the left or to the right, mm -hmm. but knowing it's not about the fall, but it's about getting up. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because you're going to fall. So in everyone's life, you know, we both, once, once I, I urge people to re really find out who their maker is. Find out who your maker is, you know, because they're going to the wrong car dealership to get their car fixed. You can't be driving a Mercedes and go to Toyota. You definitely cannot. Find out who your true maker is and, and get fixed. Mm -hmm. and once you get fixed, then you're good. Like I said, it's not that you're not gonna you're not gonna fall, but it's about to get up. The get up is gonna take you. Like see, God's promise to all of us, that his promise for us, for us to, to be fruitful, you know what I'm saying? Because the adversary comes to steal, kill, and destroy, he comes to give us. And people don't realize how they get it. How they get it. Stay focused. Correct. His journey, on that journey, he said it's gonna it, that you were gonna be prosperous. But people don't know how to get it. Philippians 419 said, my God shall supply all my needs, and he will, you know, according to his riches and glory. Like, look at me. Like, at the end of the day, you know, when people say, hey, I don't work, he, he didn't mean for us to work here. He didn't mean for us to physically go out there and work because we, he was a creator, and we're creator, we're created in his image. So, in Proverbs 18, 21, where there's power of the tongue, then we have to know the power that we have in here. Mm -hmm. That's why we, the, the power of the tongue is speak blessings and curses. So when you say I can't, then the whole universe says you can't. When you say I can, the universe say you can't. So that's why you always gotta know who you belong to and whom you belong to. And with that journey that you're walking, that you're not alone. You're not alone. And that some things are gonna be bad, but that's his way of saying, hey, keeping me here and you down here. You always gotta keep yourself here, keep him there. You know, Matthew 6, 8 said he knows what you're gonna say before you say it. And people probably, people probably say, well, if he knows what to say before he said, then why am I even praying? Because you've got to make him God. Mm. And that's the way God's going to do great things in your life. Turn it around. He's going to turn it around. He's always trying to create a miracle in your life. God is always trying to create a miracle in your life. But we, 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 we're walking around like this. We're walking around like this. We cannot receive the blessing until we open up. And knowing who we belong to, and telling you, man, and it happens every time. I'm, I'm probably one of the comedians, all the comedians you say to talk about God like this a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a turn off to a lot of other people. So to that, to me, I know how I got there. Right. You know, and I don't. You know what I mean? So be it. To whatever. I like I said, I don't hate on Steve Harvey or anybody. All those guys. I just hate the way they get to where they are sometimes, and just forget that they're just human beings. You know, Steve Harvey say, "Don't look at me." I used to see Steve get on stage and say, man, my watch co costs more than your whole outfit. Why? Why do you want to do that? Why do you want to attack another human being and make him feel so low? You don't know what that guy going to do after that show, so he may go kill himself. Well, you just having a conversation? You were. <laughs> just having a conversation talking about the one, as you said earlier, just watching what you say, how you say it, how you respond to people, how you show people who you are. That's right. Because what ends up happening is if you do the wrong thing to the wrong person at the wrong time, mm -hmm. you don't know how devastating that can be for their life. That's yeah. exactly right. right. So we, we were just having that conversation and, it, and it's funny, you sometimes get put in spaces for one reason, but it gives you something totally different. Right. That's exactly right. right. Because when I when I came here, I came for an Orlando show, uh, and I, I didn't even know I didn't know there were two shows. Right. So like hey, I came probably about 10 minutes into your show. Okay. To, into your, to your, your, your hometown review. Right. And so when I, when I walk in, you're on stage, and you know, you're doing your thing, and you know, you, you say, hey, he must have money. Yeah. And so he went, he went from there, so yeah. that's funny, right? So all that happens, and you, know, you do your thing, you get off stage, and for some reason, I'm, I'm still looking at you like, something, there's something about him. I don't, I don't, I don't know who he is. I think I've seen him. Right. And I started thinking, I'm like, I think I've seen this guy somewhere before. And I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't put it all together. But what I was impressed by, and this is the craziest thing, you had a great show, everything was, you know, top notch. But what I was most impressed by was when you got off stage, you started greeting people. 
Then you started cleaning tables. Then you started moving things around. So I watched this man who owns his own theater, who definitely could have people do that for him, but he has the respect for what he's built to be hands on all the way around. So that that was the Thank most you, impressive bro. thing for me when I was talking when I was talking to him about it. Yeah, that was one of the first things he said. He was like, Yeah, uh, he was like, Man, I didn't know I was like, but he started doing all this, he was like working in there and he was like and then I was thinking in my mind, I was like, Hey, he won us, he probably cropped the mind to us. So I'm like, I, did. Oh, he did. <laughs> I still come back here to visit. Think if you do Look, bro, it's like I said, so I am one of you because we're just human beings. We're here. Right, right, God right. designed us to be here together. This whole thing here today is what God's, God's designed for us to, to come together, to us to greet each other. For maybe if I said some things, you know, a lot of times I don't tell some of the stories that I tell when I, you know, I'm getting interviewed, you know, but I, you know, I just felt that, you know, maybe it, 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 it'll help someone else, right. you know, because in life, man, I mean, you, you go through it every day, you know, in your life people that have things and stuff like that and then they're like this you know like right. what you you shouldn't be in my space I don't know who that is that's who Steve Harvey is and right. it's it's sad and I pray for him mm -hmm. I pray for him you know um, J. Anthony Brown is on Steve's show you know he comes and performs he's supposed to be coming here more than a weekend but you know Jay Jay has cancer uh, I was wondering about that someone said something to me and I, I didn't, it was like in passing and I, I've seen him um, Dallas, I was somewhere, and I think I, uh, I thought I saw him, but I was like, you know, really thin. Yeah, he's real frail now, but you know, Jay's from South Carolina too, so he's from Columbia, and he's played here a few times and stuff like that, so I always try to reach out, like I reach out to some of my celebrity friends, and I'm like, yo, like, you know, I want you guys to come, because we, we try to put this place on the map, knowing that this place is not just, this place, place basically it's for my people, when I say my people, flight people. Uh, 20 million people come to Myrtle Beach between May, May and, 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 and August, September, August. And 18% 18, 18 of those are, are black. And they come down, they go, you know, the white things, the white things, and they you know, this is the first African American owned theater in the history of Myrtle Beach. And this is the, to let them know that they can come and have some fun and do some things, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I've had the persuaders here, the Delphonics, the Dales, you know, stylistics, they come through here. So it's something for people to do, you know what I mean? Uh, Denise Williams, uh, and, yeah, and so we give, and then we have the shows and all that stuff, so we hopefully that people, you know, you know, a lot of people don't respect me, so it's all good. Like, a lot of people here, because they hate themselves so much, like they'll ask me what I do, and I'll say, "Hey, I'm a comedian." I mean, you know, the HBO, and they ask me what I've done, and and I'll say, and they'll say, "Then what you doing here?" Like, you see, what I'm saying, like they feel that you can't, you you, you should be in Hollywood. That's where those yeah, yeah, yeah. Or and I'm like, you know, I feel sad for those people. Right. You know, like the, even the kids that I got work that work with me in the shows, they don't they don't even realize, you know, to be able to have a gym, somebody who's done it for 40 years. And, travel all over the world, you know what I mean? Like in Africa, you know, the elders, you, you want to sit at their feet because you want to you right. learn. Right. So right. that's what it's about, man. If, I wish that when I was a kid, I had somebody say, hey, I, I got a show you can sing, let me, man, I'd be like all over it, you know? So yeah. we, we often talk about if we knew what we know now, 15 years that's ago, right. we would be in this whole other space. We, we did our first technical, Film shooting, what was that, 20 years ago? Yeah, it was yeah, it's quite some time ago. Right when YouTube first started, we went out, no real training, no anything, shot this you know, independent film, and people liked it, and we liked it, and it was like, oh, that was really cool, and they never did it again. Right. You know, so if we had continued on that journey, we probably would on YouTube too. Yeah, yeah it's quite what you wanted to do. I mean, in life, it is what it is. I mean, some people like there's a, a little boy who, who comes here he, he he shot a piece he didn't know what he was shooting he he, he went you know lot you know made money on on youtube and he, and he couldn't couldn't top it never could top it again but he did it when he was 15 now he's 18 you know so i'm trying to get him to work with me because he knows how to make these things happen i'm not really like technical you know you know when i talk to joe torrey he said man you gotta get on all the plat platforms you gotta get on instagram you gotta get on this you gotta get on TikTok. i'm like, dude i can't have time in the day <laughs> i'm too old i don't have the time in the day you know what i'm saying that's joe torrey back there you see joe on the picture back there 
Oh, and, yeah. and believe it or not, Joe was like in a small town where I, we took this picture down in Dillon. It was mm -hmm. about an hour and 15 minutes away from here. And, and Joe, like, what the? I, I saw on a, on a card in the store that Joe Torrey was coming to perform at this place. I could not believe that Joe was playing down there. Mm -hmm. So I made it my point to come oh, back. Yeah. yeah. So I get there, and he's sort of like, wow. He was he was sort of like shocked to see me there. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm like, Joe, what are you doing playing this small town? He's like, ah. you know, Joe had sort of a like, little, you know, mm -hmm. little ship on his shoulder, you know. So he was like, yeah, man, you know, I'm here, I'm here. You know, guy paid me five grand, I'm coming. You know, that's what he talked about. <laughs> so I said, all right. So we, then he sort of calmed down and said, hey, man, I'm glad you came, you know, so. But no, man, it's, this, is, this is what I do. What you see is what you get, I, you know. When God inspired me or something to do, like, you know, like I said, the books and stuff like that. My wife uh, just signed up something for me to do this uh, kid's book. So she just had an idea. She said, oh, I got an idea to do this kid's book. And what you do is, like, you have to write a story and somebody's going to illustrate it. Like, I can draw characters, but I can't draw what I, what, 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 you know. So she wanted to do that for me. And so she said, hey, you got to, uh, you know, you got to write a story. And I, I went back and I said, oh, I got the story. And, and the story was, that when I was a young guy, I, uh, college, I was in my 20s and stuff like that, but I wrote this thing called Roly. It was 1985, that's how long it's been ago. It was Roly, and it was a character, and because I was always been part of Say No to Drugs, you saw that that's a little thing up there about me saying no to drugs, I've been part of that for a long time. So I wrote this story. This story is like Roly went down to, you know, the playground where he always played every day when he saw guys with drugs and all shapes and sizes and they all begin to say, if you want to play the game, you got to take cocaine like all the players do. Don't worry about the rumors of all the effects that cocaine can do for you. And Roly said no. So I wrote this whole thing called Roly Said No. So you know how long it's been ago. It's been, it's been published. And so I said, take that and put it there. To me, that's God's way of, because it was on my wife took me out before my birthday, and then she says, I did that for you for your birthday. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh wow. So I'll just put that in there. You know, that's what I do. Like I, you know, my new CD is, is doing this all a celebrity thing about I do all these impressions, you know, Bill Cosby against somebody, mm -hmm. and I put it all, I did all the voices, so I created, we're creators. So how God's gonna, gonna create all, he gonna, he gonna, he gonna supply all your needs the creation that he give you. You get an idea in your head and you say, ah, you know, like, you know, you say, I got an idea. You tell your friend, you know what, we should make ties. I ain't got time to make more ties, but that's God's giving you that idea how to not work like work regular people, you know? So you got to always think that your God is always there trying to make it work. So that's what I got out of my life, and I'm good, you know what I'm saying? I'm really good, and I appreciate you guys. Um, it's, it's really a pleasure meeting you. I mean, you know, I, I, like I said, you asked me how I looked you up, and I said no. Yeah, you didn't. so you guys did really, yeah. So well, well I'm just saying, I, I, I got a lot of value, um, you know, more than I really expected yeah. out of this conversation. I mean, I really appreciate it. You know? yeah. <laughs> so I never tell you, and I always ask God, like, you know, like for all the stuff to do and the art and, and the stuff that I create, I just always ask God, because when you know you know it's time to get out of the business. I said, God, just let me do something that I never done, and I'm just gonna keep doing it. Like 2016, if you ever Google, there's a movie called Until Forever, and it's a Christian film, mm -hmm. and it's about me being in a hospital, uh, having cancer with this little boy, you know, and you know the, the people that uh, uh, produce uh, Nicolas Cage, a uh, national treasure. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're those guys that directed the film. And that came to me through God. You know, I never get a film. I was, I was on a cruise performing. Met this little boy playing basketball. And we were talking. We were always like, I'm, I'm seeing him a couple of days. And then he says, I said, I said, I'm going to perform tonight. He said, you'll come see me. He goes, you're a performance. And my dad's a, a, a producer in Hollywood. And I said, really? He said, yeah, I'm going to bring him to the show. And so they came, came, they came to the show. I didn't ask him for anything. By the end of the cruise, they, he says, I got a film that I'm doing, it's a Christian film, and I love you be in it. I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, he says, because you look like Mr. Fenton. Mm. And, I, and you look at it, it's called Until Forever, I'm Mr. Fenton. And you talk about, you know, life imitating art. Mm -hmm. So this is art imitating life. Because what happened is, in 2016, I did this movie, and Mr. Fenton had cancer. 
right now, I have cancer. Oh, really? Wow. So when I went to Duke for my treatments, I was walking around and I had that thing in my hand and I did that in the movie. So that's to me, that was God trying to tell me something. You have to, you know, it's like, you didn't know it was coming, but it came. It's the same thing. My wife, when my wife was saying the same thing, and she was like, wow. When we were walking around, and she says, this is just like a movie. Uh, yeah. And so it's a really good movie. Be prepared to cry if you want to see it. But, uh, I'm different. I'm but God has been doing like, like incredible things for me, you know, as a writer, you know. I don't know you guys know who the white, uh, uh, Vicky Yoey, the white uh, singer, she sings in a lot of like jerseys. She sang the song because of who you are. I was on the, the One Love Gospel Cruise with her, and she asked me, "Can I write?" And I said, "Sure." And uh, I I wrote five songs on her at her, her next album. That's something I've never done. I always ask God to let me do something I've never done. So my next thing now is trying to see you guys around. My next thing is trying to do some movie. So I want to do a film. Yeah. We've been talking about that. Got side trip. Well, I'm almost a side That's trip. Right. COVID side trip. Uh, yeah. For the full force family, just a little bit. You know, we, that is our our next big challenge. We love producing content. Get it, get it done. Like a lot of, uh, you know, it's a lot of really cool. Uh, if you were watching Netflix, a lot of South African films. These guys, yeah. they really got it down. They're doing some really great things. And you know what I mean? And they can talk like us, but we can't talk like them. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. right. Yeah. But I appreciate you guys having me on. Absolutely. We appreciate you. Our, our whole platform has always been about a lot of what you just talked about. Helping others, giving good information. Very entertaining. Right. You, you checked every last one of those boxes. Well, I appreciate it. Is there, is there anything you want um, the audience to know in that camera right there? <laughs> well, I think I already told them that the, 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 the camera is just like really, truly uh, connected to your divine purpose. It's really, truly knowing who you are as a person, knowing who God created you to be, yeah. and that you know that you are gonna fall. That means there are gonna be some hard times in your life. Okay. But just stay focused. You know, but change gonna come. Absolutely. My brother, thank you. My brother. Yes, sir. Cool. That's a wrap. Once again, you know what we um, what we always say? There is no excuse for good taste, because here at the Gentleman of Style Show, we believe in better. Till next time. <laughs>